engine deep dive, understanding the ME at the OS and hardware level, and it is by Peter Boss. Please welcome him with a great round of applause. Right, so um, can everybody uh, hear me? Nice, okay, so welcome. Um, well, this is me. I'm a student at Lyon University, and um, yeah, uh, I've been, um, I've always uh, been really interested in how stuff works, and uh, when I got a new laptop, I was like, you know, how does this thing really boot? I knew everything from the reset vector onwards, so I wanted to know what happened before it. So, first I started looking at the boot guard ACM, and um, while looking through it, I uh, realized that there were, uh, not everything was as it was supposed to be, and that led to a later part in the boot process being vulnerable, which um, ended up uh, in me discovering this, and um, I found out here last year that I um, wasn't the only one to find it. Trammell Hudson also found it, and we reported it together, presented it at Hack in the Box. And then, um, at the same time, I was already also looking at the management engine. Um, while there had been a lot of research done on that before, um, was mostly um, uh, uh, the, the public info was mostly on the file system and on specific vulnerabilities, which still made it pretty hard to um, to get started on reverse engineering it. So that's um, why I thought it might be uh, useful to, for me to present this work here. Uh, so um, it's basically broken up into three parts. Um, the, the first bit is just a quick introduction uh, into the operating system it runs. So um, if you want to uh, work on this yourself, you're more easily able to understand um, what's in your face in your disassembler. Um, so, and then after that, I'll uh, cover its role in the boot process. And then um, also how um, this information can be used to, uh, to uh, start developing a, uh, a new firmware for it or do more security research on it. So first of all, what exactly is the management engine? Um, th th there's been a lot of fuzz about it being a, um, being a backdoor and everything. Well, in reality, it's, um, if it is or not, depends on the software that it runs. Uh, it's, basically, it's a processor with its own uh, RAM and its own IO, MMUs, and everything sitting inside your Southreach. It's not in the CPU, it's in the Southreach. So, um, when I say uh, this is uh, uh, going to be uh, um, about the sixth and seventh generation of Intel chips, I mean mostly motherboards from those generations. If you run a newer CPU on it, it will um, also work for that. So, yeah, a um, bit more detail. CPU it runs is based on the 8486, which, you know, is funny. It's quite an old CPU and uh, it's still being used in almost every computer nowadays. Um, so it has a, um, a little bit of, a, of its own RAM. It has quite a bit of built-in ROM. It has a hardware accelerated um, cryptographic unit. And it has fuses, which are um, write once memory like, that's used um, to store security settings and keys and everything. And then some of the more scary features. It has bus bridges to all of the buses inside the Southridge. It can access the RAM on the CPU and it can access the network, which makes it really quite dangerous if there is a vulnerability or if it runs anything nefarious. And its tasks nowadays include um, starting the computer, um, as well as um, adding uh, management features. These, this is mostly used in servers where it can uh, serve as a uh, board management controller, do like um, remote keyboard and um, video. And it does security, boot guard, which is um, the signing of a firmware and verification of uh, those signatures. Uh, it implements a firmware TPM. And there's also a SDK to use it as a general purpose secure enclave. Um, yeah, so on the software side of it, it um, runs a custom operating system, which uh, parts of which are um, taken from Minix, the uh, teaching operating system by Andrew Tannenbaum. And so it's a microkernel operating system. Um, 
runs um, binaries that are in a completely custom format. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really quite high level system, actually, if you look at it um, in terms of the operating system it runs. It's mostly like Unix, which makes it kind of familiar, but it also has large custom parts. And um, yeah, like I said before, in this talk, I'm going to be speaking about six and seven generation um, uh, Intel core chipsets. So that's Sunrise Point, uh, Lewisburg, which is the server version of this, and also um, the laptop system on the chips that uh, they're just called uh, Intel Core Low Power. They also include the chipset as a separate die, so it also applies to them. In fact, I've been testing most of the stuff that I'm going uh, to tell you about on the laptop that's sitting right here. Uh, which is a, a Lenovo T460. Um, and the version of the firmware I've been looking at is 1100.1205. Um, right, so I do need to put this up there. I am not a part of Intel, nor have I signed any contracts uh, to them. Uh, I found everything um, in, in ways that you could also do didn't have any leaked NDA stuff or anything um, that, uh, that you couldn't get your hands on. I, um, also, it, it's a very wide uh, subject area, so there might be some mistakes here and there, but generally it should be right. Right. Um, well, if you want to get started working on an ME firmware, want to reverse engineer it or modify it in some way, first, well, you've got to deal with the image file. You've got your SPI flash. It's, most of its firmware lives in the same flash chip as your BIOS, so you've got that image. And uh, then how do you get the code out? Well, there are tools for that. It's already been uh, extensively doc documented by other people. And um, you can basically just download a tool and run it against it, um, which, which makes this really easy. This is also the reason why there hasn't been a lot of research done yet. Before these tools were, were around, you couldn't get to all of the code. The kernel was uh, compressed using Huffman tables, um, which were stored in ROM, and you couldn't get to the ROM without getting code execution on the thing. So uh, there was basically no way of getting access um, to the kernel code, and um, I think also to the system library. But that's not a problem anymore. You can just download a tool and, and unpack it. Also, the Intel tool to um, uh, to generate firmware images, which you can find in some open directories on the internet, has um, Qt research, resources um, XML files, which basically have the descriptions for, uh, for all of the file formats used by uh, these ME versions, uh, including names and comments um, to go with those structure definitions. So that's really useful. Um, right, so when you look at one of these images, it has a couple of partitions. Some of them overlap, and um, some of them are storage for it, and some is code. So there's the main partitions, the FTPR and FTP, which contains uh, the programs it runs. There's um, MFS, which is the read-write file system it uses for uh, persistent storage. And then there is a um, log-to-flash option um, the possibility to embed a token that will tell the system to unlock all debug access, which has to be signed by Intel, so it's not really of any use to us. And then there is something interesting, the ROM bypass. Like I said, the, you can't get access to the ROM without running code on it. Um, and the ROM is mass ROM, so it's internal to the chip. But Intel has to develop new ROM code, and they have to test it without respinning the die every time. So. Um, they have the possibility on a unlocked uh, pre-production chipset to completely bypass the internal ROM and, and load even the early boot code from the flash chip. Um, some of these images have leaked, and you can use them to get a look at the ROM uh, code even without being able to dump it. It's going to be really useful later on. So then you've got these code partitions, and they contain a, a whole lot of files. Um, so there's the binaries themselves, which don't have any extension, and uh, there's the metadata files. So the, the binary format they use has no headers, nothing included, um, and all of that data is in the metadata file. And when you use the unme 11 tool, um, you can actually it will convert those to text files for you, so you can just get started without really understanding how they work. Um, yeah, so the metadata, 
It's um, tag length uh, value um, uh, structure, which contains a whole lot of information the operating system needs. It, it has the, the info on the module, whether it's data, code, uh, where it should be loaded, um, what the privileges of the process should be, um, a sha uh, checksum for validating it. And, um, and also some higher level stuff, such as device file definitions, if it's a, um, if it's a device driver or any other kind of server. Um, I've actually um, written some code that uses this, and it's on GitHub, so if you want a closer look at it, um, some, of the, some of the slides have a link to, uh, to GitHub file in there, which uh, contains the full definitions. Um, right, so all of the code on the ME is signed and verified uh, by Intel. Um, so you can't just go and put in a new binary and say, hey, let's, uh, let's run this. The way they do this is they, in, in Intel's um, manufacturer time fuses, they have a, um, uh, the hash of the public key that they use to sign it, and then on each flash partition there is a manifest which, contains, uh, which is signed by that key, and it contains the, the, the SHA hashes for all the metadata files, which then contain a SHA hash for the, for the code files. Um, there doesn't seem to be any major problems in verifying this, so it's useful to know, but it's, you're not really going to use this. And then the modules themselves, as I've said, is a, they're, they're flat binaries, mostly. And um, the metadata contains all the info the kernel uses to reconstruct um, uh, the actual program image in, in memory. And um, a curious thing here is that the, um, the actual base address for, for all the modules, for all the programs, is, is the same across an image. So if you have a different version, it's going to be different. But if you have two programs from the same firmware, it's, uh, they're going to be loaded at the same virtual address. Right, so when you want to look at it, um, you're going to load it in some disassembler, like for example IDA, and you'll see this. It, it, it disassembles fine, but it's going to reference all kinds of memory that you don't, don't have access to. So usually you think maybe I've loaded out the wrong address or, um, or am I missing some library? Well, here you've loaded it correctly if you use the, the address from the metadata file. But you are in fact missing a lot of um, memory segments. And um, let's just take a look at each, each of these. It's, um, it's, it's calling it, so it should be code. It's, um, and it's pushing a pointer there, which is data. Um, and uh, what's that? So it, it has shared libraries, even though it's flat binaries. It, it actually does use shared libraries because you only have one and a half megabyte of RAM. You don't want to link your C library into everything and, and waste what little memory you have. So there's the, um, uh, the main system library, which is like libc on a Linux system. It's um, it's in a flash um, partition, so you can actually just load it and, and take a look at it easily. Um, and it, it starts out with a jump table, so there's no symbols in the metadata file or anything. It doesn't do dynamic linking. It it loads the um, it loads the pages for the shared library at a fixed address, which is also in, in the shared library's uh, metadata, and then um, it's just there in the process of memory, and it's going to jump there um, if it needs a function. And the functions themselves are just using the normal um, System 5 um, x86 calling convention. So it's pretty easy to, to look at that using your normal uh, tools. There's no weird register argument passing going on here. So right, um, those shared libraries, there's two of them. And this is where it gets annoying. Um, the system library, you've got access to that, so you can just take your time and go through it and try to figure out, you know, hey, um, is this open or is this read or what's this function doing? Um, but then there's also another, like, second really large library, which is in ROM. They have all the, um, the, the, the C library functions and some of their custom helper routines that don't interact with the kernel directly. Um, such as the strings functions, they, they live in ROM. So um, when you've got your code, and this is basically where I was at when I was here last year, you're looking through it and you're seeing calls to a function you don't have the code for all over the place, and you have to figure out by its signature what is it doing. And that works for some of the functions. It's really difficult for other ones, so I, that really had me stuck for a while. Then I, um, 
I managed to find one of these ROM bypass images and I had the code for a very early development build of the ROM. Um, this is where I got lucky. So the, the actual entry point addresses are fixed across an um, entire chipset family. So if you have an image for the server version of like the 100 series chipset or for a client version or for a desktop or laptop version, it's all going to be the same ROM address point, uh, sorry, um, uh, the ROM addresses. So even though the code might be different, you have the uh, jump table, which means the addresses can stay fixed. So this only needs to be done once. And in fact, um, when I upload my slates later, there is a slide in there at the end that has the addresses for the most used functions. Um, so you're not going to have to repeat that work, at least not for this chipset. Um, so if you want to look at a, a simple module, um, you've loaded it. Now you've, um, you've uh, applied the things I just said, and it, you still don't have the data sections. Um, in fact, I don't, don't know what that function there is, is doing, but it's not very important. It, it actually returns a, um, a value, I think, that's not used anywhere. Uh, but it must have a purpose because it's there. Um, right. So then you look at the entry point, and this is a lot of stuff. And uh, the main thing that matters here is on the right half of the screen, there is a listing from a Minix repository. And on the left half, there is a disassembly from an ME module. So it's mostly the same. There is one key difference, though. It, the ME module actually has a little bit of code that runs before this uh, C library startup uh, function. And um, that, that function actually does all the ME-specific initialization. There's a lot of stuff related to how C library um, uh, data is kept, because there is also no. Um, no data segments uh, for the C library um, being allocated by the kernel. So um, each process actually reserves a part of its own memory and tells the C library like any global uh, variables you can store in there. Um, but when you look at that function, one of the most important things that it calls is this function. Um, it's, it's very simple. It just copies a bunch of RAM. So they don't have support for initialized data sections. It's, it's a flat binary. What, what they do is they, they actually use the BSS segment, so the, the zeroed segment at the end of the um, address space, and copy over um, a bunch of data in the program. The program itself is not aware of this. It's, it's really in the initialization code and in the linker script. Um, so um, th this is also something that's very important, because you're going to need to also, at, at that address in the uh, data section, you're going to need to load the last bit of the, um, of the binary. Otherwise, you're missing constants, or at least in association values. Right. Um, th then there's the, the full memory map. Um, to the processes themselves, it, it's a flat 32 bit address space. It's, um, um, it's got everything you expect in there. It's got the stack and, uh, and the heap and everything. Um, there's a little bit of heap allocated um, right on initialization. Um, this, is, um, this is basically how you derive the, the address space layout from the metadata. Um, especially like the, the data segment and the, and the stack itself is like the, the, the location varies a lot because of the number of, of threads that are in use um, or the size of data sections. And also, those stack cards, they're not really stack cards. There's also metadata for each thread in there. But that's not, nothing that's relevant to the process uh, itself, only to the kernel. And well, if you then skip forward a bit and um, you, you, you've done all this, and you look at your, um, at your simple driver, like this, this is taken from a driver used to talk to the CPU. Um, like, OK, so when I say CPU or host, I, by the way, I mean the CPU, um, like your big uh, Sky Lake or KB Lake or Coffee Lake, whatever, your big CPU that runs your own operating system. Um, Right, so this, this is used to, to send messages there. But if you look at what's going on here, um, OK, I think I have a problem with the animation here. Uh, it, it sets up some stuff, and then it calls a library function that's in uh, the main syslib library, uh, which actually has the main loop for the program. That's because Intel was smart, and they, they added a, a nice framework for device driver implementing programs. Because it's, it's a microkernel, so device drivers are just user and programs calling specific APIs. Um, then there's normal POSIX file I.O. No standard, um, no standard I.O., but it, it 
has all the normal open and read and IO, CTL, everything functions. And then there's more initialization for the server library. And this is basically what all the simple drivers look like in it. Um, and then there's this. Um, because it's so low on memory, they don't actually use st uh, standard IO or even printf uh, itself to, um, to do most of the debugging. It, it uses a, a thing that's called Sven. I'll touch on that later. Um, so there's the familiar APIs that I talked about. Um, it even has POSIX threads, or at least a subset of it. Um, and then there is all the functions that you'd expect to find on some generic Unix machine. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem to do with. But then there's also their own tracing solution, Sven. That's what Intel calls it. The name is in all the development tools that you can download from their site. And uh, basically, they don't include format strings for a lot of the stuff. They just have a 32-bit identifier that is sent over the debug port. And um, it refers to a format string in a dictionary that you don't have. Whereas one of uh, the dictionaries for server chips are floating around the internet, but even that is incomplete. Um, and the um, normal non-NDA version of the Intel developer tools has some 50 format strings for really common um, status messages it might output. But yeah, like if you see these functions, just realize it's doing some debug print there. It might be dumping some state or just telling it it's going to do something else. It's no important um, logic actually happens in here. Um, right, so... Then for device files, they're, um, they're actually defined in the manifest. When the kernel loads a program and that program wants to expose some kind of interface to other programs, um, its manifest will contain, or its metadata file will contain, a um, special file producer um, uh, entry. And that says, you know, you have these uh, device files with a name and an access mode and a user and group ID and everything, and the minor numbers. and the kernel uh, sends this to the, um, or not the kernel, the program loader sends this to the uh, virtual file system server and it automatically gets a device file pointing to the right uh, major and minor number. And then there's also a library, as I said, to um, provide a framework um, uh, for a driver. And uh, that looks like this. It's. Um, it's really easy to use if you were a ME developer. You just uh, write some callbacks for, for open and close and everything, and it automatically calls them for you when a message comes in telling you that that happened, which also makes it really easy to reverse engineer, because if you look at a driver, it just loads some callbacks, and um, uh, you, you can know by their offset in the structure what actual uh, call they're implementing. Right, so then there is one of the more weird things that's going on here how the actual user land programs get access to memory map registers. There's a lot of this going on. Calls to, to, to a couple of functions that have some magic arguments. Um, the second one you can easily tell is the offset because it, it, has, um, it increases in very um, nice power of two steps. So it's probably the register offsets and then what comes after it looks like a value. And then the first bit seems to be a magic number. Well, it's not. There's also an extension in the metadata saying you, these are the memory mapped I.O. ranges. And those ranges, um, they, they each list the physical base address and a size and, and the permissions for them. Um, then the index in that list does not directly correspond to, to the magic value. The magic value, actually, you need to uh, do a little computation on that, and then you can access it through those functions. The computation itself might be familiar. Um, yeah, so these are the functions. Um, the value is a segment selector. So they, they use the, um, actually don't use paging for interprocess um, isolation. They use segments, like x86 protected mode segments. And uh, for each memory mapped IO range, there's a separate segment. And you manually specify that, which is just weird to me. Like, why would you use? x86 uh, segmenting on a modern system. Uh, Minix does it, but yeah, to then extend that even to this. Luckily, normal address space is flat, like to the process, not to the kernel. Right, so now we can access um, memory mapped IO. 
Um, no, that's all the um, like the really high-level stuff. So what, what's going on under there? It's got all the basic microkernel stuff, so message passing, and then some optimizations to actually make it perform well on a really slow CPU. Um, the basics are you can send a message, you can receive a message, and um, you can send and receive a message where you basically say send a message, wait till a response comes in, and um, then continue, which is used to wrap function calls. Um, this is mostly the same as in Minix. Uh, there's some subtle changes which I'll um, get to later. Um, and then memory grants are something that only appeared in Minix really recently. It's a way for a process to basically create a new name uh, for a piece of memory it has and give a uh, different process access to it just by sharing the number. These are referred to by the, the process ID and the, and, the, and the number of that range. So the process IDs are actually um, a local per process. So to a uniquely identify one, you need to say process ID plus that number. Um, and they're only granted to a single process. So when a process creates one of these, it can't even access it itself unless it creates a grant for itself, which it's not really that useful usually. Um, and these. Um, these grants are used to prevent having to copy over all the data in, inside the IPC message used to implement a system call. Um, yeah, these are the basic operations on it. You can create one, you can copy it to and from it. Um, so you can't actually map it. A process that receives one of these has to say to the kernel using a system call, um, please write this data into that um, area of memory that belongs to a different process. And then there's also indirect grants. Because you know, in Minix, they do have this, but also only recently. And usually, if you have a um, microkernel system, you would have to copy your buffer for a read call first to the file system server, and then back to like um, either the hard disk driver or the uh, device driver that's implementing a device file. So the ME actually allows you to create a grant, pointing to a grant that was given to you by someone else, and then. Um, that grant will inherit the privileges of the process that creates it, um, combined with those that it assigns to it. So if, if the process has a read-write grant, it, it uh, can create a read-only or a write-only grant, but it cannot, uh, if it only has a read grant, it cannot add write-writes to, uh, to it for a different process, obviously. Um, so then there's also some big differences from Minix. In Minix, you address a process by its process ID or thread ID with a generation number attached to it. In the ME, you can actually um, address IPC to a file descriptor. Um, kernel doesn't actually know a lot about file descriptors. It just uh, implements the basic thing where you have a list of files, and then each process has a list of file descriptors assigning integer numbers to those files to refer to them by. And this is used so you can, um, as a process, you can actually directly talk to a device driver without knowing uh, what his process ID is. So you don't send it to the file system server, you send it to the file descriptor, and the kernel just magically corrects it for you. And they uh, moved select into the kernel. So you can tell the kernel, hey, I want to wait till the file system server tells me that it has data available, or till a message comes in. Um, this is one of the most complicated system calls the ME offers that's used in a normal program. Uh, you can mostly ignore it and just look like, hey, those uh, arguments are the, the file descriptor sets as a bit field, and then there's the um, uh, the message that might have been received. And there's DMA locks, because you don't just want to write to registers, you actually might want to do the direct memory access uh, from hardware. So you, um, you can actually tell the kernel to lock one of these memory grounds in RAM for you. It won't be swapped out anymore, and um, um, yeah. It will even tell you the physical address, so you can just load that into a register, and it's it's not really that complicated. It's just lock it, get a physical access, write it into a register, and 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 continue. Um, well, that's the most important stuff about the operating system. Um, the hardware itself is a lot more complicated because the operating system, once you have the code, you can just reverse engineer it and get to know it. Um, the hardware, well, let's just say it's a real pain to have to reverse engineer um, a piece of hardware together with its driver. 
Like if you, you've got the driver code, but you don't know what the registers do, so you don't know what a lot of the logic does, and um, you're trying to f both figure out what the logic is and what the actual registers do. Right, so first you want to know which physical address goes where. And it's um, the, the metadata, the listings I showed you actually had names in there. Uh, those are not um, in the metadata files themselves. Uh, I annotated those. Um, so you just see the physical address and size, but there's the um, uh, one module, the bus driver module. Um, and the bus driver it, um, it is a normal user process, but it uh, implements uh, stuff like PCI, configuration space accesses, and, and those things. And it has a nice table in it with names for, for devices. So if you just run strings on it, you'll see these things. And um, yeah, when I saw this, I was, um, I was pretty glad, because at least I could make sense what device was being talked to in a, uh, in a certain program. So the bus driver, it does all these things. It manages power gating to devices. It, it manages configuration space access. It manages the different kinds of buses and IOMMUs that are on the system. And it makes sure that the normal driver never has to know any of these details. It just asks it for a, um, for a device by a number assigned to it at build time. And then the bus driver says, OK, here's a range of physical address space that you can now write to. So that's a really nice abstraction. And also gives us a lot of information because um, the really old builds for Sunrise Point actually have um, a hell of a lot of debug strings in there as printf uh, format strings, not as fan catalog IDs. It's one of the only pieces of code for EME that, that does this. So uh, that already tells you a lot. And then there's also the table that it just talks about that has the, the actual info on the devices and names. So I generated some uh, DocuWiki uh, content from this that I use myself. And this is what's in the table, part of it. So it tells you what address the, the PCI configuration space lives at. It tells you the, the, the bus device function for it through that. It tells you on what uh, chipset SKUs they are present using a bit field. And it tells you their names. In, in different fields, it also contains the values that are used to, to write the base address registers for PCI, so also their normal memory ranges. And there's even more devices. So the ME has access to a lot of stuff. A lot of it is private to it. A lot of it is com uh, components that also um, exist in the rest of the computer. And there's not a lot of information on a lot of this. These are basically all the things that, um, that are out there together with um, the conference slides published by other people who have do, done research on the ME. I did not have time to add links to those, but they're easy to find on Google. Um, uh, I'll get later to this, but uh, I um, actually wrote an emulator for the ME, um, a partial emulator, uh, to be able to run uh, ME code and analyze it, which obviously needs to know a bit about the hardware, so you can look at that. Um, there are some files in Intel's debugger uh, package that um, in specific version, versions of that that have uh, really detailed info on some of the devices, also not all of it. And I wrote some tool to parse some of the files. It's really rough code. I published it because people wanted to, um, to see what I was doing. Um, it doesn't work out of the box. And there's a nice talk on this by um, um, uh, Mark Aramlov and Maxime Goriachi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but they've done a lot of work on the ME and this particular talk by them is really useful. And then there's also something else. There is a second DME in server chipsets, the innovation engine. It's basically they copy paste the DME to provide a ME that the vendor can write code for. Don't think it's used a lot. I've only been able to find HP software uh, that actually targets it. And that has some more debug strings, but also not a lot. It mostly has a table containing register names, but they're really abbreviated. And for a really small subset of the devices, there is documentation out there uh, in a Pentium NNJ series data sheet. It seems like they compiled their logic code or whatever with the wrong defines because it, it doesn't actually fit into um, to the manual uh, that well. It's just a section that has like f some 20 tables that shouldn't be in there. Um, Right, so this is from that talk I just referenced, and it's an overview of the innovation engine and the bus bridges and everything in there. 
Um, this isn't like very precise. So uh, based on some of those files from System Studio, I tried to get a better understanding of this. Which is this? This is the entire chipset. The little DMI block in the top left corner is what connects to your CPU, and all of the big blocks with a lot of ports are um, are uh, bus bridges or um, switches for PCI Express like uh, Fabric. Um, yeah, so there's a lot going on. The, the highlighted area is the man uh, management engine memory space, and the rest of it is like the global um, chipset. Um, well, the things I've highlighted in green here are on the primary PCI bus. So there's this weird thing going on where there seems to be two PCI uh, hierarchies, like at least logically. So in reality, it's not even PCI, but on, on Intel systems, there's a lot of stuff that behaves as if it is PCI. So it has like a bus device function and numbers, um, PCI configuration space um, registers. And they have two different routes for the configuration space. So even though the configuration space address includes a bus number, they have two completely different things with each, each of which has its own bus zero. So that's, that's weird also because they don't make sense when you look at how the hardware is laid out. So this is stuff that's on the primary PCI configuration space that's uh, directly accessed by the, um, by the north bridge on the ME CPU. So that's the... Um, minute IA system agent. System agent is what Intel calls a north bridge nowadays. Now that's not a separate chip anymore. And it's the, um, it's basically just the north bridge and the, and the crypto unit that's on there. And the stuff that's directly attached to the north bridge being the ROM and the RAM. So the processor itself is, as I said, derived from a 486, but it, it does actually have some more modern features. It, it does CPU ID, um, at least on my systems. Uh, some other researchers said theirs didn't. Um, it's basically the core that's in the Quark MCU, which is really great because it's one of the only cores made by Intel that has public documentation on how, on how to uh, do run control, so breakpoints and um, um, accessing registers and everything over JTAG. It's, Intel doesn't publish this stuff except for the Quark MCUs because they were t targeted at makers. Um, but they reuse that in here, which is really useful. Um, it even has an official port to the um, Open OCD debugger, uh, which I have not gotten to test because I, um, I don't have a JTAG probe, which is compatible with Intel voltage levels and um, supported by uh, Open OCD. And it also has, like I said, CPU ID and MSRs. It, it has some really fancy features like branch tra uh, tracing it, um, and um, um, some more um, strict paging uh, permission enforcement uh, stuff. And they don't use the, uh, the interrupt pins on this. So it, it, it's an IP block, but if uh, there's some files out there, um, that's where this, uh, this screenshot is from, uh, that actually uh, are used by, by a built-in logic analyzer Intel has on the chipset, and you can select different uh, signals on the chip to, to watch, um, which is a really great source of information on how the IP blocks are laid out and, and, and what signals are in there, because you basically get a tree view of the IP blocks on the chip and some of their signals. Uh, they don't use the um, legacy interrupt system. They, uh, they, they only use... Um, like message-based interrupts by where the device writes a value into a register on the interrupt controller in, instead of as asserting a pin. And then there's the North Bridge. North Bridge is um, it's partially documented in that data sheet I, I mentioned, and it um, it does support um, uh, x86 I/O address space, but it's never used. Everything in the ME is um, a memory space or uh, exposed as memory space through bridges. Um, uh, the North Bridge implements access to the ROM, RAM. It, it has a I/O MMU, which is uh, only used for transactions coming from the rest of the system, and it's always um, initialized to, um, like you said, at least in the firmware I looked at, it's always initialized to the inverse of the page table. So um, linear addresses can be used for uh, memory map, uh, for, sorry, for, for DMA. Um, it also does PCI configuration space access to the uh, primary PCI bus, and it has a firewall uh, that actually allows the, the operating system to deny any 
uh, IP blocking the chipset from uh, sending a completion on a bus request. So it can actually say, hey, I want to read some register, and only these devices are allowed to send me a value for it. Um, so they've actually thought about security here, <laughs> which is great. Then there's um, one of the most important blocks in the ME, which is the, um, the crypto engine. And it, it does some, uh, some of the more well-known crypto um, algorithms, AES, uh, SHA hashes, um, RSA, and it has a secure key store. Uh, which I'm not gonna uh, told a lot about it in their um, ME talk at Black Hat. Um, and a lot of these uh, things have DMA engines, which all seem to be the same. Um, and there is no other DMA agents, uh, engines in the ME, so this is also used for memory to memory copy or DMA um, into. Um, to other devices, um, yeah. So that's used in a lot of things. This is actually a diagram which I don't have the vector for anymore, so that's why the, um, the LibreOffice uh, background is in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the, this is basically what that crypto engine looks like when you look at that signal tree that I uh, was talking about earlier. Um, the DMA engines are both able to do memory-to-memory -memory copies and to directly target um, the crypto unit they're part of. Um, basically, when you... Uh, I don't know about the control bits that go with this, but um, when you set the target address to zero and the right control bits, it will copy into uh, the buffer that's used for the, for the encryption. So that is um, how it accelerates memory access for crypto. Um, and these are the actual register offsets. Uh, they're the same for all of the DMA engines in there, uh, relative to the base address of the subunit they're in. And then there's the second PCI bus, uh, or bus hierarchy, which is like in some places called the PCI fixed bus. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure whether this is actually implemented as a PCI bus as I've drawn it here, but this is what it behaves like. Um, so it has all the DME private stuff that's not uh, a part of the normal uh, chipset. So it has timers for DME, it has the, um, the implementation of uh, um, the secure enclave stuff, the, the, the firmware TPM registers, um, and it has uh, the gen uh, device which I've mostly ignored because it's only used at boot time. It's only used by the, the actual boot ROM for the ME mostly. It um, is what the ME uses to get the uh, fuses Intel burns. Um, so that's the Intel public key and whether it's a production or a pre-production part. Um, but it's pretty much a black box. It's not used that much, fortunately. There's the IPC block, which allows the ME to talk to the sensor hub, which is a different CPU in the chipset. It allows it to talk to, to the power management controller and all kinds of other embedded CPUs. Uh, so it's interprocessor communication, not interprocess. Uh, confu confuse me for a bit. <laughs> um, and there's the host embedded controller interface, which is how the ME talks to the rest of the computer um, when it wants to, the computer to know that it's talking. So it, can directly access a lot of stuff, but when it wants to send a message to the, to the EFI or to Windows or Linux, uh, it'll use this. And it also has status registers, which are really simple things where the ME writes in a value, and even if the ME crashes, the, the host can still read the value, um, which is actually how you can see whether the ME is running, whether it's disabled, whether it um, um, fully booted or whether it it crashed halfway through, but at a point where it could still uh, get the rest of the computer running. And there is some core boot code to, to read it, and I've also implemented some decoding for it on, um, on the emulator, because it's useful to see what those values mean. Right. So then there's something really interesting, the primary address translation table, which is the bus bridge that allows the ME to actually access uh, the PCI Express fabric of the, of the computer. And for a lot of the, what I in this table call ME peripherals that are actually outside the ME um, domain in the, uh, in the chipset, it, um, it uses this um, uh, to access it. It also uses it to, to access the um, UMA, which is an area of host RAM that's used as a swap device for the ME, and a trace up, which is a debug port. But it also has a couple of windows which allow the ME to access any um, 
random area of host uh, our, uh, host RAM, which is the most scary bit because UMA is specified by host, but the host DRAM area is well, you can just point it anywhere. You can read or write any value that um, that Windows or Linux or whatever you're running has sitting there. So that's uh, that's scary to me. So, and then there's the rest of it in the, uh, the rest of the devices which are behind the primary ATT. And um, that's a lot of stuff. That's debug. Um, uh, that's also the, all the normal uh, peripherals that your PC has. But it's, um, it also includes things like the power management controller, which actually turns on and off uh, all the different parts of your computer. It controls clocks and reset. And, um, so, this is really important. And there's a concept that you'll come across when you're reading Intel manuals or um, ME related stuff that's root spaces. Um, besides your normal addressing information for a PCI device, it also has a root space number, which is basically how you have a single PCI device exposing two completely different address spaces. Um, and it's zero for the host, it's one for the ME. Um, some devices expose the same uh, information on there, other ones behave completely different. Um, but yeah, that's something you don't usually um, uh, see. And then there's the sideband fabric. So besides all the stuff that I just covered, which is PCI-like, at least, uh, there's also something completely different, sideband fabric, which is a completely packet switch network um, where you don't use um, any memory mapping by default, you just have a one byte address for a device and some other addressing fields and you just send it a message saying, hey, I want to read configuration or data or, or memory. And there's actually a lot of information out there on this uh, because Intel, it seems like they just copy pasted their internal specification into a patent. Um, this is how you address it. Um, this is all the devices on there, which is quite a lot. It's also what you, um, if any of you are kernel developers and you've had to deal with GPIOs on, on um, Intel socks, um, there's this P2SB device that you have to use. That's what the host uses to access this. Um, their documentation on it is really, really bad. Right, so this was all done using static analysis, but then I, I, I wanted to figure out how some of the logic actually worked and it was really complicated, so I wanted to, um, to play around with VME. Um, there was this nice talk uh, by Ermolov and Goriachi which, where they said, you know, um, you can now, uh, we, we found a, uh, an exploit that gives you code execution and you, can, you get, can get JTAG access to it. Sounds really nice. It's actually not that easy. So arbitrary code in the execution in the BUP module, they actually um, described their exploit and how you should use it. Um, but they didn't describe anything that's needed to actually implement that. So if you want to do that, what you need to do, you need to figure out where the stack lives. You need to know, you need to write a payload that will actually get it from a buffer overflow on a stack that, by the way, uses stack cookies. So you can't just overwrite the return address um, to turn that into an arbitrary write. And you need to find out what the return pointer ad uh, address is so you can overwrite it. I need to find ROP gadgets because the stack is not executable. Right, so and then, um, and then when you've done that, you can just turn on debug access or a chain load of custom firmware or whatever. <laughs> so what I did is I, um, I had a bit of trouble getting that running and in order to test your payload, you have to flash it into the system and it takes a while and then the system just doesn't power on if the ME is not working, if you're crashing it instead of getting code execution. So it's not really viable to, to develop it that way, I think. Some people did. I respect that because it's really, really hard. Um, then I wrote this, ME loader. It's called loader because at first I started out like writing it as a sort of a wine thing where you, where you would just map the right uh, ranges at the right place and, and jump into it, execute it, patch some, uh, some system calls. But because the ME is a microkernel system and almost every user space program accesses hardware directly, it ended up implementing like a good part of the chipset, um, at least um, as stubs or enough logic to, to get the code running. Um, and I, 
I um, later on added some features that actually allow it to talk to hardware. Um, I can use it as a debugger by just because it's actually running the ME firmware uh, or parts of it inside a normal Linux process. I can just use GDB uh, to debug it. Um, and uh, back in April last year, I got that working to the point where I could run the bootstrap process, uh, which is where the vulnerability is. Um, and then you just develop the, uh, the exploit against it, which I did. And then I made a mistake cleaning up some old change root environments for um, closed source software, and I nuked my home dear. Yeah, I hadn't yet pushed everything to GitHub. So I stuck with an old version, and I decided, you know, let's refactor this and turn it into something that might actually at some point be published, which, by the way, I, I did last summer. This is all public code, the ME loader thing. It's on GitHub. Um, and someone else beat me to it and replicated that exploit by the Russian guys, which up to then, they had produced a um, proof of concept thing for an Apollo chipset, uh, Apollo Lake chipset, uh, which is were completely different for, from what you had to do for normal ME. Um, I, uh, so that's actually, um, I was a bit disappointed by that, not being the first one to actually replicate this. But then I did, about a week later, I got, it, uh, got my loader back to the point where I could actually um, uh, get to the vulnerable, uh, vulnerable code and, and develop that exploit, and got it working not too long after. And here's the great thing. Then I went to the hackerspace. I flashed it into my laptop, the image that I had just been using on the, on the emulator. I didn't change it. I flashed it. I was like, this is never going to work. And it, it worked. Um, and I've still got that image on a flash chip with me because that's what I used to actually turn on the debugger. And then you need a debug probe because that USB-based uh, debugging stuff that's mentioned here only works pretty late in boot, this, which is also why they only released the Apollo Lake stuff, because on those chipsets, it, you can actually use this for the ME. Um, and then you need this thing, uh, because there's a second channel that is, it's using the USB plug, but it's a completely different physical layer, and you need an adapter for it, which I don't think was intended to be publicly available, because if you go to Intel's site and say, I want to buy this, they say, like, here's the CNDA, please sign it. Um, but it appeared on Mouser. And luckily, I knew some people who um, had done some other stuff, got a nice bounty for it, and, and uh, bought it, and I let me use it. Um, thanks to him. It's expensive, but you can buy it if it's still up there. Haven't checked. That's the link. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit late, so I'm going to use the time for questions as well. So the, the main thing the ME does that you cannot replace is the boot process. It's not just um, breaking the system if you don't turn it on. It actually does stuff that has to be done. So you, you're going to have to use the ME anyway if you want to boot a computer. Um, don't necessarily have to use Intel's firmware, though. Um, the ME itself boots at like a microkernel system, uh, so it has a process which implements a lot of the servers. Uh, that will allow it to get to a point where it can start those servers. This process has very high uh, privileges in older versions, which is what's being used on these chipsets. And if you exploit that, you're still ring free, but you can turn on debugger and you can use the debugger to become ring zero. Um, so this is what the normal boot process for a computer looks like. And this is what happens when you use boot guard. There's a bit of code that runs even before the reset vector. And that's started by microcode initialization, of course. And this is what actually happens. <laughs> um, the ME loads a new firmware into a power management controller. It, it then readies some stuff in a chipset, and it tells the power management controller, like, please um, stop pulling that CPU reset pin low, and the CPU will start. Power management controller is a completely independent thing. It's a uh, 8050 OneDrive uh, microcontroller. Um, runs real-time operating system from the 90s. This is the only string in the firmware, by the way. That's quoted there. Um, and um, depending on the chipset you have, it's either loaded with a patch or with a complete binary from the ME, and it does a lot of important stuff. No documentation on it besides the ACPI interface, which is not really any useful. The ME has to, does, has to do these things. It needs to lo load, the, uh, load the keys for the uh, boot guard process. It needs to set up clock controllers, and then uh, tell the PMC to turn on the power to the CPU, 
uh, needs to configure PCI Express Fabric and uh, reset, uh, turn it, uh, like uh, get the CPU to come out of reset. Um, there's a lot of code involved in this, so I did really didn't want to do this all statically. What I did is I added hardware support, um, hardware pass-through support to the emulator, and booted my laptop that way. I actually had a, a video of this, but I don't have the time to show it, which is a pity. But this is what I had going on. I had the, the, the bring up process from the ME running in a Linux process, uh, sending whatever hardware accesses it was trying to do that are important for the boot um, to the debugger. And then that was using a ME uh, in real hardware that was um, halted to actually do the register accesses. And it worked. It, um, yeah, so I was not going to show this. It actually booted the computer reliably. Um, then. Boot card configuration is fun because you know where they say they fuse in the um, they fuse in the keys. Well, yeah, but the ME loads them from fuses and then manually loads them into a register. So if you have code execution on the ME before it does this, you can just load your own values and you can run core boot even on a machine that has boot card. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go through this really quickly. This is, by the way, this, these are the registers that configure. Um, what security model the CPU is going to enforce for the firmware. Um, I'm going to release this code after my talk. It's part of a Python um, script that I wrote that uses the debugger to start the CPU without ME firmware. I traced all the accesses the ME firmware did, and I now have a Python script that can just um, start the computer without uh, Intel's code. Um, if you translate this into a ROP sequence or even into a binary for the ME, you can start a computer um, without the ME itself, uh, or at least without it running the operating system. <laughs> One. So, yeah, m future goals, I uh, really do want to uh, uh, share this because um, if there's a way to, ex to escalate to ring zero um, through the ROP chain, then you could just start your own kernel on the ME and have custom firmware at least from the, ec from the vulnerability on. But you could also build a mod chip uh, that uses the debugger interface to uh, load a new firmware. Um, there's a lot of stuff still needs to be discovered, but um, I'm going to hang out at the open source firmware um, village later, at least part of the week here. So, because um, I really want to get started on open source ME firmware using this. Um, right, and there's a lot of people that. Um, that uh, played a role in uh, getting me to this point. Um, also would like to thank uh, a guy from my hackerspace, uh, Pino Affa, who basically allowed me to use the, his laptop to prepare the, um, the demo, which I ended up not being able to show. But um, Right. Um, I was going to ask whether there were any questions, but I don't think there's really any time for that anymore. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time left. I'll be around. I'll, I'll be around. So. I think it's very, very interesting because I hope that your talk will uh, inspire many people to keep looking into how the management engine works and hopefully uncover even more stuff. I think we have time for just one single question. I don't know. Do we have one from the internet? Thank you so much. Okay, um, first off, I have to tell you, your shirt is nice. Uh, Chad wanted me to say this. And um, they asked how rel reliable this exploit is and does it work on every boot? Right, yeah, that's actually um, something really important that I forgot to mention. Um, <laughs> so they patched the vulnerability, but they didn't provide downgrade protection. If you can flash a vulnerable um, uh, image, with an exploit in it, it'll just boot every time on these chipsets. So six, seven generation chipsets, put in that image, and it will reliably turn on the debugger every time you turn on the computer. Thank you so much for the question. And Peter Boss, thank you so much. Please give him a great round of applause.